How you doing, everybody? You're very, very welcome tonight to Traz and Atira, and we're going to be discussing one of the most hotly debated topics in Irish history. I'm Marcus Howard of Easter Rising Stories, and no matter where you are in Ireland, this is an issue which has touched everybody. Never did an issue divide the Irish nation like the treaty debates of 1921 and of early 1922. Ultimately, of course, this division in the Dáil led to the tragic civil war. People's politics and families split and arguably, you know, we could say we're still talking about it today, uh, no matter whatever viewpoint you hold. We're joined again by the excellent Des Dalton, who's no stranger to Trazanatira, and he'll be setting up a website and he's also considering publishing some of his work on the treaty negotiations and dull debates and his love of this history period. Some of his posts have been absolutely fantastic. I've been sharing nearly every one of them. Um, you're very, very welcome tonight. I'll be reading out the questions at the end, but only questions, okay? Because it's a big debatable topic. Okay, so Des, you are more than welcome. Thanks, thanks, Marcus. So, um, do you want me to kick off? Yeah, where we go. Okay, okay, Marcus, well, First of all, again, uh, Garmila Mahagwiv to uh, Trasna Natira for again giving me the opportunity um, to uh, to present here tonight um, on the on tonight on the on the on the on the Dáil debates. Um, I've really enjoyed, I really enjoyed the last um, the last session as well, and the feedback on it was brilliant. So, as I say, it's it's really been enjoyable tonight. So, again, as I did with the um, with my talk on the treaty negotiations. Um, I'm rather than getting into the kind of the nitty gritty of of the, of the actual speeches themselves, we can maybe do a little bit more of that maybe in the questions. I'm kind of just going to kind of give a, a, an overview. I'm going to concentrate. Maybe I am going to look a little bit at a couple of what I would I've picked out. These would be just my own personal choice of notable speeches. I think that are are worthy of a little bit closer examination. Um, and I, I I just I'm kind of just going to maybe name check them rather than anything else and as I say we can maybe go up into that a little bit further later on and um, as I say kind of just give a, an overview of the debates and their significance and um, really what they meant in terms of the aftermath as well and you know as we now know where where, where all this was leading to so anyway to begin with um, just first of all um, a couple of little statistics regarding the, the, the debates themselves. And um, I'm drawing this from the excellent work that was done by Liam Weeks and uh, uh, Michal O'Fartig. Um, they, they published a, a book a couple of years ago on it and they did some really uh, fantastic qualitative um, um, statistical analysis on the, on the debates themselves. And just a couple of, just a couple of figures that, that kind of stick out. First of all, the entire debates, and this will be no surprise to you, Marcus, um, there was a total of 440,000 words spoken uh, in the debates. Um, the three principal speakers were obviously uh, De Valera, Griffin and Collins. Um, De Valera actually accounts for um, the combined, almost the combined total of Griffin and Collins together. De Valera was, was responsible for 40,000 words. Griffith 22,000 and Collins 20,000. Um, just, you know, some other interesting um, statistics regarding it are um, the, um, the number of times that particular words are mentioned. No surprise, treaty is mentioned um, 1,704 times, people 1,404. The word republic is mentioned 604 times. Ulster, again, and this maybe reflects you know some of the comment about the whole uh, the, the lack of mention of, of of Ulster and Partition is mentioned just 79 times now I think there are other reasons for that but again we can go into those later on and also what's interesting here in terms of the um, the balance of debate um, there are obviously the constitutional and the kind of if you like the, 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 the national question obviously dominates and consequently that's reflected in the fact that words like economic economical and economics are mentioned just 52 times throughout. Um, and um, for instance, out of 338 pages of the debates, only nine of them um, are related to partition. So they're just, just some, some of the figures relating to that. Um, the debates themselves are, I suppose we, we have to kind of put ourselves 
back in 1921, 22. Um, it's not obviously, a, a, you know, a, an era of, uh, as we live in today, of instant communication and the world of social media and so on. Um, communications were, 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 were very limited. So for a lot of people, the TDs, uh, and, the, and the wider public, and they were depending on the press coverage of debates. This was the first time that people were really getting an opportunity to find out what was the treaty, what 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 was entailed in this. And as I say, for a lot of the TDs that walked into um, Earlsford Terrace, um, this was the first time that they were going to hear about this debate. And many of them did come in prepared to be persuaded one way or the other. Uh, a number of them had their minds made up going in, but there were quite a number of them that were in that kind of middle ground that were there to be to be persuaded on that. So the the, the, the doll debates are really, really important from that point of view. Um, they really, really would set the tone uh, for what was happening on the outside. Now, there are other things happening on the outside that would also set the tone for the doll. And I think that's where we will say, and again, we'll, we'll come to that, that's where the Christmas break was so was so vital in that. Um, the, the debates themselves were held in Earlsford Terrace in the UCD. Um, the reason that they weren't in the mansion house was that there was actually a Christmas fair on, of all things, in the mansion house, and uh, it wasn't available. Um, and De Valera was chancellor of UCD, and they they um, they, they got a use of the the council chamber there uh, for the debates. Um, there's actually some controversy. There was controversy about the debates or about the the, the suitability of the venue. Um, and as you could probably see from the the the, the, the first slide there, actually. Um, you can see, and I think you, you, you may have seen in recent um, TV coverage, they've actually shown, it's now called the Kevin Barry Room. Um, it's actually quite a narrow room, and there was a lot of complaints. First of all, there was a limited number of members of the public and press that could actually get in there. The acoustics were not very good, and um, it was just deemed generally un, un, unsuitable. Um, there were seemingly at one point during the Christmas break, there was a suggestion that they would look for an alternative venue that could maybe accommodate more members of the public um, after Christmas. And seemingly De Valera objected to that. Um, he, he, at that point, he was, he was satisfied that they would continue to use the, uh, use the council chamber. But that's just a little bit, as I say, a little bit of background on, on where they were held. Um, in terms of the, um, sorry, Back there. Um, the speeches that were given, I have picked out what I would regard as speeches that were um, quite significant. Um, and those were those that came from Lee Mellows, Mary McSweeney, Kathleen O'Callaghan, Michael Collins, Sean McEntee, Sean O'Kelly, and Dr. Francis Farron. And by the way, a shout out to Colm O'Rourke actually for the photograph that the middle photograph is actually Dr. Francis Farron. And there hadn't been a photograph, um, seemingly it's, it's, it's very, very rare. And I know that Colm, in the good work that he's doing on his, um, on collating and collecting the, um, the, 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 the casualties and um, those that, were, that, that died on the, on the Republican side during, this, during the, the War of Independence, the Civil War period, um, he's been collecting photographs and so on of those. And that's one that surfaced for him. So again, thanks to Colin for that and for letting me use it here tonight. Um, but those speeches, I picked them out because I think that there's um, there's a significance to what was said in them, and um, I think that they uh, they're worthy of note because they they reflect not just. Um, not just um, uh, you know a polemic attack on the, on the treaty, but there's also quite a, an amount of uh, analysis there, and um, also I think um, really what they had to say in, in, in many respects is still quite relevant. I think um, looking you know looking back from 2022 uh, back to back to 1921-22. Um, and I think for those reasons, I think their, their speeches, you know, particularly stick, stick out. Like, for instance, I'm looking at Sean McEntee. Um, one of the, the issues that people would bring up continually about the treaty, the Bates themselves, um, are the lack of mention, is the lack of mention of partition and um, of the whole issue of the Northeast 
and um and and and, and so on and uh, this is often cited as um that really that there was a lack of interest in 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 the north if you like uh, amongst the, the 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 mass majority of the cds now i think that's actually inaccurate um and i think there's again like most things in history there's there's a lot of new ones and there's more layers to that really the significant reason for it is um that people were uh, had bought into the fact that there was going to be a boundary commission and on both sides of the debate both pro and anti treaty and that what it was looking like um was that there was going to be um basically that the six county state was was possibly there was a strong possibility that for instance Fermanagh and Tyrone were going to actually be brought into the new free state and that effectively the, the four counties that would be left um and maybe parts of those counties as well would be would would would, would be siphoned off such as South Armagh that you know the entity that would be left would be economically unviable and that consequently partition was going to be basically short lived and you know that to an extent you know explained why there wasn't the same focus on partition um as there would be obviously later on and i actually as i say i think it's it's quite unfair i think it's whilst as i said from those you know if you look back at those statistics that are read out there and the fact that ulster was only mentioned you know i think it's something like what nine pages out of 338 and so on or partition um that somehow you know quite obscures the the truth of the of the of the matter to a certain extent as well because um within that if you look at it um, as I say, people like Sean McEntee and Francis Farron and others, when they did speak on it, there, there's actually, what they had to say was actually quite important and reflected the fact that partition actually was quite important. And it's it sprinkled, there is references to partition um, throughout the speeches of the, of the, of the other, of the other um, uh, contributors to the Dáil debates as well. So it's not a fact that it, it, it was just something that you know, people weren't concerned about, they were, and it was being talked about and it was being mentioned. And I actually saw, I think it's, um, uh, I saw a comment recently actually, and I thought it was quite significant. And it showed, you know, they, they, they were making a the point that the, what was being made was that um, partition actually had quite a significant impact, not only in the treaty debates, but in the aftermath of the treaty debates and in the, in the, in the build up to the civil war. Um, and there was a variety of issues from the Belfast boycott, um, right through that all played a key role in the build up to the attack and the forecourts and so on so partition really was underlying a lot of the issues that were there um as i say in the in, in the lead up and you had the the you know things like the um um you had a number of standoffs and a, a couple of pitch battles on the border in the months leading up to the civil war as well so i mean it's, as i say it's not as a, as an issue as if it had gone away but anyway, the reason that I'm picking out Sean McEntee is that McEntee's speech actually is very significant, uh, I think, in terms of he's one of the one of the few that really tackled partition and the effects of partition in a very profound way. And again, it's no coincidence. I mean, McEntee himself was from Belfast and he had a quite a deep understanding of the of the issues that were at stake. And some of what he had to say was quite actually quite prophetic. And he was talking about, for instance, in terms of education. He was, he was basically saying that what, once these two entities were established, the Free State and the State of Northern Ireland, that effectively you were going to have two different polities on the island of Ireland and that it would ultimately develop in very, very different ways. And, you know, he was saying that his argument was that you can, you can talk as much as you, as you want about, you know, we're going to develop a new education system here. We're going to develop, you know, the Irish language and, and Irish culture and so on. In the six county area in the in the new state of Northern Ireland, um, that's not going to happen. So that you're going to have an entire generation of even young nationalist children that are going to grow up uh with you know no access to that kind of culture and so on, and all of the, the effects that go with that. And he also talked about you know the dominance of of one religion and that it was effectively you know it 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 it, it was going to become a one-party state and all that, that would entail. So that's quite significant. And it, again, it showed a profound engagement with that issue. Francis Farron actually is also quite interesting in that regard. And going back to the reference to the Boundary Commission and the way that people are putting in that. And Francis Farron, um, and if you if bear with me here, I, it's actually um, it's actually worth, uh, I think it's actually actually worth quoting. And um, this has been one of my, my Bibles over the last 
the last number of weeks. Um, but uh, Farron actually made re- makes reference to the Boundary Commission. And what he had to say, um, as I say, I, I, I think is quite, is quite significant. Um, he, he says that they are only entitled to three and a half counties on the basis of population. And he's talking about this is the, the based on the on the, um, the the demographics and so on that were being used to justify partition. Uh, but those double barreled numbers or members, I don't say they are anxious to do it, but they will do it. They will place these two and a half counties permanently into possession of Craig and his successors permanently in the possession of a hostile state, for he won't be there forever. And I don't think I have any more to say. So basically what Fern is saying there is that um, what happened effectively, uh, that the Boundary Commission, far from weakening the six county state, the Boundary Commission was likely to actually strengthen it because actually, as it turned out, um, it was suggested that less than taking counties from the six county state, they were suggesting that parts of Cavan and Monaghan would actually be included in it. Um, so ultimately the status quo was accepted. So that's that that's interesting that that comment and it, it, it's one of those lesser, it's it doesn't receive the attention that I think it deserves. Um, and the fact that you know here in you know January 1922, um you you had this been argued in the doll, and that somebody actually was saying, you know, crime stop and saying that there's you know there's there, there's a problem here. And that all may not be as as has been promised and has been suggested. Um, Mary McSweeney again was one of the big contributors to it uh, in so many ways, and I mean her speech was a, a tour de force. Um, some argue that it cost votes to the pro- to the anti treaty side uh, because of its length, and also because it significantly there had been De Valera had been anxious, and, and many, and, and particularly on the anti treaty side, were anxious to wind up the debates before the Christmas break. And because Mary McSweeney's speech, which ran for, I think, two hours and 40 minutes on the, I think it was the 21st of December, um, it actually meant that it, it, it was quite obvious by that, that, by that evening that the doll, that wasn't going to be possible. Um, and, um, you know, there was, there was she, Mary was mocked during her speech at, at particular times by, by, by those on the pro-treaty side about the, uh, the length of her speech. But actually to read the speech itself, uh, again, it's, 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 it's quite profound, it's moving. Yes, there is, there is the, the, the rhetoric and so on, and that's their part of it. Uh, but if you wanted, to, if you like, to encapsulate the, um, the Irish separatist Republican tradition um, and to, um, if you like to, 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 to get a manifesto of what, what it represented. I think Mary McSweeney's speech kind of sums it up and she, she, she brings all those elements, the spirituality of Pierce, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a, you know, she, 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 she combines that with a very militant uh, defense of, of, of Irish Republicanism and what, what it entails on Irish nationality. And, you know, her, her famous, um, you know, she, 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 she uses the famous metaphor of that, you know, each generation, this, this generation may be wiped out entirely, but like Dragon's Teeth, another generation will come forth ready to, again, to continue to fight and carry it on and so on and so on. So Mary's speech was actually, Mary McSweeney's speech was actually very, quite a profound um, Republican argument against the treaty and in defense of that kind of concept of Irish national uh, independence and Irish nationhood and, 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 and defining what that meant and what it entailed. So again, I think it's a very, very significant speech. Kathleen O'Callaghan, likewise, and I'm going to deal with her a little bit more just in, in the next segment. Um, Sean O'Callaghan, I, I pick out as well, because again, uh, there was an element of a speech um, where he, he, he actually talks. And I think, again, I think it's quite an, an interesting reference he makes. Um, and if you just bear with me just, just for a moment. And uh, he, um, he talks about Andy Cope and his influence um, in in the uh, in the in the treaty negotiations and indeed in the whole in the whole process leading leading to the treaty and I think that's quite significant that that reference was made in the doll and um, I think it's uh, it's it again it's it's worked um, it's worked uh, it's worthy of comment. Um,
yeah, it's just here, uh, where he actually talks about he he. Sean Kelly or Skelly, as, as was his pen name, um, he talked about the, the fact that he had actually opposed the whole idea of um, the treaty negotiations to begin with. And he said one of the reasons that he opposed it was, um, I opposed it until it became only too obvious that the insidious council of Cope of the castle had permitted our whole body politic. And I think that's quite an interesting observation from a Kelly, um, because Cope, as I think I talked about this in the in 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 my previous talk on the on the treaty negotiations, Andy Cope, who was the assistant um, under secretary of Dublin Castle, um, was kind of the key British civil servant that, if you like, kind of meshed the whole thing together. And like as I said, he had been in discussions with people like Collins and Griffith going back to December of 1920, and his hand is there right the way through, right the way through the treaty negotiations and the build up to the truce, um, right through that summer of 1921. And right through and, and, and right into, as I said, the treaty negotiations. And at every critical juncture, it's Andy Cope in contact with people like Eamon Duggan and so on that's kind of pulling the strings, if you like. He's kind of pulling the threads together at, at, at critical moments. And it's interesting that O'Kelly um, should, should make that point and make it in such a very, very specific way. Again, one of those um, comments and one of those um, speeches that doesn't, again, receive the attention that I think it should receive. Um, Lee Mello's speech is a tour de force as far as I would be concerned. I think it's it's one of those, um, I think it's 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 probably one of the most rigorous anti-imperialist, anti-colonial analysis of the treaty uh, that's there. And again, very, very prophetic uh, what he had to say. Um, he talks like about, first of all, he, 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 he states a very, you know, the, the, the kind of very Republican position on the treaty and on the Republic. And he, he argues and contends that they're far from being an ideal, the Republic is actually a living reality. And it's a, it's a functioning reality. And, you know, it's functioning in as government departments and has, uh, you know, foreign representatives and so on. But then he goes on to talk about what the, what the, the, the treaty will actually mean in real terms. And um, for instance, he talks about the fact that um, the new state that human nature being what it is, once people get a stake in that new state, uh, that in itself will become the end in itself. And that all the, you know, the, the fine rhetoric and talk about a stepping stone and 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 um, the disleading to somewhere else, that ultimately anything that's going to destabilize that state, you know, uh, is not going to be interest of those that hold the levers of power. And that rather than um, advancing the national ideal of a, of, a, of a 32 county Ireland, that those holding the state will, as, as, as Mello says, ultimately become the new Dublin Castle, that they'll become the barrier of government between the British and the Irish people. And if you, if you look at the events of 1969-70 in particular, uh, where, if you like, the rhetoric of the Fort Greenfield met the reality of, you know, uh, you know of, 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 of what was actually happening in the six counties, at that point, you could see that, if you like, the Dublinist political class, be it Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael, were, you know, their, their ultimate um, instinct at that point was to kind of circle the wagons and ensure that whatever instability was happening in the six-county area, it was not going to permeate and it was not going to undermine their state. And so, if you like, what Mellows had said, you know, 50 years previously was being played out there. So I think, again, his speech is definitely worth revisiting, and I, I would certainly urge anybody to to look at that speech because I think there's 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 so many nuggets there to be to be taken from it, um, and likewise Collins, uh, again uh, his interventions are are few, but they're significant. Uh, you know when he when he, when he makes them, um, and uh, again I I know it with Collins. One of the things that I noticed with with with, with Collins is and again there. There's a sadness about this as well, and, and it actually, the entire debate at times, there's a great sadness because there's often points where people are professing their, their continued affection and, and regard for each other across the floor. Uh, but there's also a sense that this is kind of only leading one way and it's, it's, it's not going to a good place. And that particularly comes across in the exchange between Collins and Boland. And, you know, they were two people that had been very, very close and had, had, had been confident of each other. And it's quite sad to actually see that the, the level of bitterness at that stage, it's coming out 
between the two. And um, you know, in 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 many respects, it's emblematic of the of the of the wider divide that's happening within the country. So I, again, I think that uh, you know, I think that the the, the Collins Boland um, particular um, particularly between those two, I think is is quite interesting. The exchanges and so on that that that, that occur. Um, the Furies, the women TDs. Again, this is another narrative, and I, 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 it was very much a narrative of the time. And I also noticed it creeping in. I've, I've noticed it even with some commentators, um, even dealing with the centenary, um, people who would, you know, um, thump their chest at any suggestion of 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 of, of misogyny or anything else. But it, it there's a, a narrative playing in there of first of all the the the, the women TDs being dismissed. Um, as you know, almost kind of irrational that a lot of them that it was more to do with the fact that they had you know personally suffered, they had suffered a personal loss and so on, and that, that framed their view of the treaty and that they weren't engaging with it in any kind of rational way. And the Furies, obviously, I, I, I take that from uh, the infamous chapter in P.S. Hegarty's book, The Victory of Sinn Fein, um, where he basically dismisses the anti treaty women as that. And you know, as we as we go into the centenaries of 2022 and 23, we will see how the new free state treated those those women. And you know, I I talked a little bit about it last year when I was talking about Margaret Buckley. Um, but you know, there was a particular, if you like, um, those women regarded and a wider Republican activist uh, female base were, were regarded with great great suspicion by those on the on the on the pro treaty side. So as I say, there's 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 been a dismissal of these women, um, which is you know I I I I think it's very very unfair and it's it's actually quite uh, unhistorical as well because again, if you actually you know look at these people themselves, they had agency in their own right, and um, yes, a number of them were people that had suffered personal loss, but there were men there that had suffered personal loss as well. Like for instance, Count Plunkett. Um, he got up and he spoke about his 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 executed son and his other sons that had suffered imprisonment and had faced um sentence of death. Um, Sean McSweeney, for instance, is there. He's the brother of Terence McSweeney. Um, and and yet no reference is really made to those, but yet it's made to Kathleen Clark and and Margaret Pierce and so on, uh, and Kathleen O'Callaghan. Um, but if you actually read what those women had to say. Yes, they are making reference to that, and rightly so. Kathleen Clark um, and Margaret Pierce both say, they, because they're accused at one point by by Finian Lynch um, from Kerry on the pro treaty side of rattling the bones of the dead before this assembly. And I think it's um, uh, Margaret Pierce actually says that yes, I make no apologies for rattling the bones of the dead, and she talks about her dead sons, um, and she said, I think we're entitled to do so. We have suffered, we have suffered this loss, and. Mary McSweeney, for instance, talks about like sitting for the seventy-three days beside her brother, watching him die in 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 Brixton Prison, um, and to say yes, you know, if we're not entitled to, to speak about these people, then then who to then who are? Uh, but they also make it clear that they have other things to say, um, uh, outside of the fact that they had their own agency. And for instance, I think it's um, uh, Kathleen O'Callaghan, and I'll actually come to that in a moment. She actually makes that reference to the fact that these women, as I say, had their own agency. Like, for instance, Kathleen Clark herself was a Republican before she ever met Tom Clark. And um, she came from a, a Fenian background. And um, so she was very much a, a Republican in her own right. Mary McSweeney, likewise. And actually, there, there's an argument to be made that in many respects, Mary had probably maybe a more profound influence than, on Terence than, than vice versa. And then, for instance, you had Dr. Ed English, who had, <clears throat> if you like, she had suffered no personal loss, uh, but again came to her position from a very, you know, uh, ideological position. Not that the other women didn't either. Uh, likewise, Constance Markovich was the same. Again, um, she she hadn't suffered any 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 personal loss. So I think to do that, to dismiss those women, is to deprive them of their own agency and their own uh, inherent work as 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 people and um, as political actors in all of this. Um, and uh, I, I, as I say, whatever about the attitudes and whatever of the time, but to, to see that seep into into the current, I think it's it's it, it, it's quite sad to see that, and it actually angers me, um, because I think that's that's going to be very much part of the flavour of our debate going into in, 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 into into twenty twenty two, and I think it's important that those women's voices are heard, 
and that we do hear what they have to say. And, and in that regard, I think Acting you know, O'Callaghan's speech, again, is a tour de force in this regard uh, and what she has to say. And I think it, it encapsulates a defence of their right um, to, 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 uh, to, to speak and to be there and to be, to be actors in their own right and voices in their own right. And um, as she says there, like she said, that no woman in the stall is going to, um, is coming here out of any kind of warped sense of deep personal hurt, but she's talking about the, it, it doesn't mean that they don't have deep convictions about Ireland's status. And um, I think her, her final, her final um, quote there then, where she talks about like that the, that the, that the women of Andal, um you know that, and 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 likewise, the women of Ireland are 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 standing for principle over expediency. And you know, I think it's it's quite inspiring. I think what Kathleen Connor has to say. And at one point, she's actually has to defend her husband's legacy. Her husband had been mayor of Limerick, and almost in a carbon copy of the murder of Thomas McCartan a year earlier, he had been murdered in 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 March of 1921 in almost identical circumstances, and it had been suggested by some of the pro treaty side that that he. he he, he, you know, he wasn't even a Republican. Uh, and again, Kathleen O'Gannon is forced to defend her husband's, um, her husband's um, legacy as, 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 as an Irish patriot and so on. But at the same time, she gives this very reasoned and this very, I think, um, a very quite profound defense of their right as women, as women activists, that they have invested their own, you know, they've made their own personal investment in this movement for independence and that they have every right to stand there in the doll as representatives of the people uh, voicing their opinion. So again, I think Kathleen O'Callaghan's speech, again, I, I, I would ask, it, it's again, it's one of those speeches that's one of the lesser known, but I think it's one that's definitely worth revisiting and I think people should certainly pay it some attention. Um, the other important question that came up uh, in, during the, 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 the treaty debates, and it begins even in, it begins in the private sessions, like in the, the, the and, and the, the private sessions are quite important from this point of view. That um they were called um there was I think there was I think there was four private sessions in total. Um the, the, initially they were to look at De Valera's document number two, and um the idea was that uh De Valera had argued that he didn't want document number two to become um um, he didn't want it to cross over into, into, into the formal treaty debate. He wanted the louder treaty debate to continue and a vote be taken. And at that point, then that he would he would introduce his his, his alternative treaty, if you like. And um, the idea of the of the of the private session was that it would be an opportunity for all the deputies to read the document and to discuss it and debate it. Now, also in the private session, and these had this had occurred during the War of Independence as well. The private sessions were used for security reasons. To discuss issues regarding the IRA and the army and the, and the kind of you know, like the military side of what was happening on the outside, um, and you will often see references in in the in the treaty minutes where a specific question is asked. Like at one stage, Harry Boland asked a question in the I think it was a private session on the sixth of January, and he asked a private he asked a, a direct question of uh, Richard Mulcahy, his chief of staff, as to what was the fighting condition of the army, because he was worried he was hearing you know, different views. He'd just come back from America and he wanted to know, you know, what, what was his capability? And uh, um, Mulcahy asked to be excused so that he can he can um, refer to um, a source of information regarding that and to come back. And in the meantime, Cahal Brua then uh, answers him as Minister for Defence. And in, 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 the, in, in the minutes, it's recorded as that the Minister of Defence fully answered um, Deputy Boland's uh, question, um, and again for security reasons, there's no no detail carried there. So um, one of the questions that came up again, as I say, in those sessions, was regarding the standing of the army. So at the very early debates, um, Carl Brewer and De Valera and and Collins uh, are appearing as is Mulcahy on both, as I say, on both sides to say that the standing of the army hasn't changed; its chain of command remains. Uh, it you know it remains accountable to the doll and so on. Like for instance, um, I think it's at the very first public session. I think, um, on the fourteenth of December, there's a complaint made that there's been a proclamation posted on 
at the front door of the of the of the uh, Earth for Terrace, uh, an anti-treaty proclamation, and there's a complaint about who 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 put this up. Now it seemingly it was Seamus Robinson. Um, Carl Brewer um, you, makes it clear that it wasn't authorized by the by the by the army, and that there will be an investigation and so on. Um, and there's that, that's a recurring theme throughout. Now, again, as the debates develop there's a sense there that the army is another vice and it's not just a kind of a, a passive observer of what's happening. And Seamus Robinson's contribution, I think, again, is significant from this point of view because he kind of brings it all out into the open. Um, like he begins his speech, for instance, by reading a letter which is signed by the OCs of the 1st, 2nd and 3rd Southern Divisions and also by the OC of the Dublin Brigade. And the letter purports to speak for all of the brigades within each of those divisions and so on. And it's, it's basically uh, reaffirming its allegiance to the, to the Republic and et cetera, et cetera. Now this meets protests from De Valera and from, 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 from Collins and, and, and Griffith on the other side, who say that the army shouldn't be brought into this, um, that, it, that the army should remain on the sideline. And Seamus Robinson protested this, and this is where I think it's quite a significant intervention here from Seamus Robinson because it reflects What's happening outside in an ultra reflex, if you like, this is the next stage. When the treaty debates are over, this is where the debate is moving next, and it's moving to the army. So he says, for instance, um, if we had no political outlook, we would not be soldiers at all. And he says that in answer to De Valera, when De Valera attempts to silence him um, and, and saying that the, the, the letter shouldn't be read. So he's, he's, basically, he's making the point, and he goes on to reinforce it when he says, we are not a national army in the ordinary sense. We are not a machine, pure and simple. We have political views as soldiers. And De Valera acknowledges that and he acknowledges that they're citizen soldiers and so on. But again, this is a sign that this, this is not just going to be confined to, if you like, the political class, that this division now is, is, is taking shape within the army and the army is going to have more, more to say about that. And for instance, at right at the very, at the, I think it's the very last session on the 10th of January, after De Valera has resigned and they elect the, the, the new provisional um, uh, government um, which Arthur Griffith is elected as the, as, as, as the new president and so on. And at the final, actually the last words that are spoken are spoken by Richard Mulcahy. And he, he rises to affirm that the army's position remains unchanged um, as was that of the Minister of Defence as well. And he's just been appointed Minister of Defence in succession to Brewer. And then there's a little bit of an interlude. There's a few other comments passed back and forth. And he rises again because he said somebody has questioned that he didn't say that it remained the army of the Republic. And he said, I reaffirm that it is the army of the Republic. And again, that it remains in the same situation. And in many respects, those words are, are, are quite, um, they, they, they prove that yes, that was the situation as, as Mulcahy hoped it was, but you know, events were going to overtake that in uh, you know once once the 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 the, the doll broke up and um the treaty had been ratified or not ratified but I mean approved by the doll um this was going to take on a new life and you know as I say as we move into 2022 we'll be looking you know things like the army convention in March 1922 and so on all of those all of those things become very very significant. So as I say I think Seamus Robinson's speech is quite and quite important. And again, doesn't receive the attention I think it should because I say it's a it's a flag, it's a signal that you know the army are you know that 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 things are happening here and that people like because I say people like Robinson, he's representative of the views of people like O'Malley on the outside, people like Lynch, um, Andy Cooney and, and and many other key military leaders there. And if you like, he's he when he stands up to speak there, he's he's, he's speaking as their voice in the doll. Um, that brings us to the walkout. And again, it's one of those controversial moments. Um, and this occurred on the um, on the tenth of the tenth of January, the, the, the very last sitting of the, if you like, the the the, the, the treaty debate, debate, the vote itself occurs on the seventh. Um so just a, just to give the, a little bit of the build-up to it, um there was an attempt made on the sixth of January, and um, there was an ad hoc backbench committee drawn up by backbench TDs from both the, the pro and anti-treaty side. They had come together on the 5th of January in an attempt to basically try and form some kind of coalition government. Um, 
And the idea was that I, I think the words that are used, Owner Duffy was a member of it, Joe McGuinness, Patrick Hogan, um, Garrod O'Sullivan were on the pro treaty side, and then on the anti excuse me, on the anti treaty side, then you had people like Lee Mellows, Arthur Connor, um, Patrick Rutledge, um, I think Sean O'Kelly, I think was on it as well. And the idea was that they would, they would the, the, the idea was to, to I think the word the, the wording that they use is that we would preserve or that we would um maintain the services of the president, De Valera. And the idea would be that De Valera would remain as president and that he would call on his supporters or the, uh, the, the anti-treaty side to, if you like, to abstain. Um, this was in the event of the treaty being passed from any division on the on the question of the treaty and that De Valera would remain in, in, in situ as president and preside over a, you know, a, 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 an administration. Um, not surprisingly, um, I, I, I see it in some quarters that, that you know, it's it's commented that De Valera, um, you know, that, that he blocked it as if this is somewhat a surprise. Well, you know, not surprisingly, he did, because as he said himself, he said, I'm basically being asked to, we're being asked to, to um, enter an administration which is going to bed down the treaty, whilst at the same time that we, you know, we bed down the free state and then try and knock it down later on. You know, I mean, it, it just logically, it just didn't make sense. Anyway, that didn't come to anything. It was a private session held on the morning of the 6th um, in a final attempt to see if some kind of an agreement could be brought together on that. At that session, then De Valera announced that he was going to resign uh, as president. And that created some uproar and Griffith accused him of um, that he was trying to um, personalise this and that he was trying to use his own weight of his own popularity and reputation um, as a proxy for a vote on the treaty. So that basically people would be voting on De Valera as president and by default then to reject the treaty. Um, ultimately then De Valera agreed that he would remain as president provided that a vote on the treaty was held within 48 hours. Um, it was actually held within 24 hours, uh, as it turns out, it was held the next day. Uh, now, at that point, De Valera, um, Mary McSweeney and others made it clear that if the Dáil was to ratify the treaty and um, if there was to be a, you know, a new administration elected, um, there would have to be a guarantee that that you know, would, would, would continue as the um, a government of the of the republic because the, the point they made was that the only people that could disestablish the republic were the people so that even if the Dáil approved the treaty and again this is actually an important point to make about the treaty debates the Dáil is actually not mentioned in the treaty and um, so for the purposes of the treaty all the Dáil was doing was and 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 this is point is made a number of times by, by speakers throughout the debates the Dáil is simply marking approval or disapproval of the treaty um, in terms of what would happen next, the machinery there were that the members from the very of, of the constituencies of those that were elected to the Southern Parliament um, of Ireland, which is provided for in the Government of Ireland Act, that they actually were the body that would be uh, empowered with um, ratifying the treaty formally. Um, so the argument that was made by De Valera and those on the on the anti-treaty side was that if the new president um, or the new administration uh, if they were going to act as a body that was going to, you know, um, enforce that and call this new rival body to the doll, that it wouldn't be possible for the Republican deputies to, to remain, you know, uh, for, for such a vote, because basically the doll then would be asking to do something that would usurp itself and subvert itself. And um, that, 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 that was a marker that was, lay, was laid down there. And another significant thing, and Mary McSweeney actually makes this point, and a very significant one, she made the point that the Dáil was open to all the representatives of all the people, of all representatives within Ireland, whereas this new Southern Parliament, um, um, that or this, this, this other body that would meet, was actually not open to all representatives of the people of Ireland. And Sean O'Mahony, who was elected for Fermanagh, he was the only TD that a number of them, such as Collins, for instance, was representing both Armagh and Cork. Likewise, De Valera, I think, South Down and Clare. O'Mahony was the only one that represented a solely six-county constituency. So it meant that with this new assembly, he was, if you like, the, and this is the way Mary McSweeney described it, he was the test case. And basically, McSweeney uh, or uh, O'Mahony would not be allowed to sit in, in that assembly. And again, from the Republican perspective, from the anti-treaty perspective, that again showed that this was not going to be an all-Ireland body it was quite distinct from the doll and so on. 
So for all of those reasons, uh, De Valera, McSweeney and others in Brewer, their argument was that if uh, the treaty was ratified and if there was a new pro-treaty administration and they were to cause such an assembly in their name, that as Republican deputies, they couldn't, they couldn't remain in situ. And that's precisely what happened. The vote itself for, on the treaty took place on the 7th. Now that particular day, actually just uh, in a, another notable speech, I think is one worth commenting on uh, just briefly, is a speech by Cahal Brewer. Um, it's one of the more notorious speeches. Again, I, I think it needs to be looked at more closely. I think there's context required here as well. Um, it could, I, I, it can be argued, and I would argue myself, I think it's quite ill-judged, um, but I think there's a, a reason for it as well. As I say, there's a context. It was a very personalized attack on Michael Collins. Uh, now there's been quite a simmering um, rift between Collins and Brewer. I think like, actually the dynamics of the debates are interesting from that point of view. Like you have a number of those things going on. You have Griffith and Childers, for instance, like another one of those you can see it's, it's playing out in a public forum here for the first time. Likewise, Brewer and Collins. And Brewer, for instance, takes this opportunity to uh, attack Collins and he goes in as Minister for Defence. He goes into the structures of the army and the GHQ staff and the various, and he, and he makes the point that Collins is just part of one department and he describes him as a subordinate with, with, you know, within, within that department. And he challenges Griffith's claim that Collins was the man that won the war and so on. And he questions whether Collins had ever actually fired a, a, a gun in anger and whatever. Um, now it's, 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 it's very, very, very personal. And, um, but as I said, there's a context because Brewer as Minister for Defence um, had for long uh, argued against the influence of, for instance, the IRB. And this goes right back, I think I talked about this in, 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 in the last talk on the, on the treaty negotiations, um, that there was a long rift between, if you like, the, within the national movement, uh, between people like De Valera and Brewer, Stack and others, and Collins and the IRB on the other side, because the opinion of someone like Brewer was that the IRB had served its purpose after 1916. You know, the fight was out in the open now, the Irish volunteers, the IRA were up and running, there was now a doll, um, we had now had a government in place, and there was no need for this, if you like, um, state within a state. And um, there was, a, you know, Brewer constantly felt undermined by uh, the influence um, of the IRB within the army, and uh, you know, that, that played out, for instance, in, in, in the new commissions that were issued to the army in November of 1921, um, where they were asked to uh, to take a, a fresh oath to the doll and so on. And that was seen as an attempt to kind of, you know, kind of push back against, against the influence of the IRB. So all of this was all playing out in the speech by Brewer. And likewise, Collins, Collins came back. Now, also at the end of that speech, just as Mary McSweeney had done, Brewer again sets out, you know, that this separatist Republican tradition handed down by apostolic succession, you know, from, and he, he talked about from Tone right down through the Young Irelanders and the Fenians and so on and so on. Again, it's a classic kind of document of that, and he restates that at the end of it. Um, anyway, at, the, at, 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 I think Griffith closes the debate for the pro-treaty side and the vote is taken, and it's, it's quite close. Um, despite the fact that during, uh, again, just referring briefly to the Christmas break, there's a huge sway. I think there's out of something like three, I think 300, something like 320 public bodies support the treaty. Only five oppose it. Um, I think there's only something like two, um, if not maybe three local newspapers. The rest of the, the, the national and local newspapers uh, are in favor of the treaty. Um, but there's a, that that has a huge influence. And like, a, you know, Dan O'Rourke, for instance, from um, South Mayo, South West Common, he gets up and actually says on the last day, on the day of the vote, that if the vote had been taken before Christmas, he would have he would have been voted against the treaty. But when he had gone back at Christmas and he had met his constituents and he'd met men uh, and women that he had fought with and that that as in his words had, had you know had been the the diehards, um, they had pressed on him the importance of him supporting the treaty and he felt that he couldn't go against them. Um, Frank Drawn is a, a, another example of that in Waterford where he was opposed to the treaty. He actually resigned his seat before the, before the treaty vote because um, he felt that he couldn't go against the wishes of his, of his constituents, but he couldn't bring himself to vote for the treaty either. And he was kind of caught in that bind. 
Now, other deputies get up and they make it clear that as far as they were concerned, their mandate had always been a Republican mandate and they'd made that clear to the constituents. And if the constituents wanted another TD, then that was fine. They, you know, they, 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 they could vote them out at the next election and so on, but they had never made any any bones about the fact that they were Republicans and had been elected on a, on a Republican mandate. In fact, a number of them make it make the point during the debate that if um, the pro-treaty TDs had made those arguments before the electorate in May 1921, or <clears throat> in, in probably more to the point in December of 19, 1918, that they wouldn't have been elected. Uh, it was because precisely that they were standing on a Republican platform that the defeated those who were coming kind of from that kind of constitutional nationalist position. But anyway, um, as I say, uh, that was kind of the state of play of forces on the 7th of January when the vote was taken. So the vote was actually quite tight, despite the fact that there was that kind of quite large sway. I think the reason for that is that you're looking at the people that you're looking at here are people that were invested in this revolutionary movement, many of them predating 1916. So that all of those questions really, you know, it, it, it's, you know, in terms of taking an opinion poll and that ultimately these people were going to be guided by their own ideological base. So, I mean, you're looking at four, four TDs made the difference here. If four TDs had changed their vote, the treaty would have been rejected. So anyway, the, the treaty was uh, um, approved by 64 to 57. And that brings us then to the resignation of De Valera. And ultimately um, he's proposed again, um, Kathleen Clark actually proposes him. Now, it's interesting, in her um, memoir, A Revolutionary Woman, her autobiography, she actually says that she was very much opposed to him submitting his resignation, and she said that to him. And she was actually asked to propose him, and she refused. And she was actually, as she was walking into the, into the, um, into this chamber for the vote, Margaret Pierce was the first to come to her, and she said to Margaret Pierce she wouldn't be doing it. And um, Shanti O'Kelly was the chief whip on the uh, anti-treaty side. And when he was told what had happened, he came to her. You're talking minutes now before the before the the, the doll comes into session, and um, she says she she's adamant she's not going to do this. And you know, Kelly goes away and comes back and says, we can, "Look, we can't get anybody else. It's too late." And ultimately, he prevails on her by invoking the name of her of, of Tom Clark and said, "Look, you know myself and Tom were were very very close, and so on." And I'm asking you in his name, and she, she says in her in her in her book that, you know. She, could, she couldn't refuse and she got up and she, she, she said that she was prepared to vote for De Valera, but not to nominate him because she, she, she felt he was wrong to, um, she felt it was his ego that made him resign and that she said, she said to him, you know, you resign, you won't be re-elected. And he, he, she's, he, he told her he was, he was sure he would be re-elected. And she said, no, because she said like the people that have backed Griffith on the treaty are not going to um, vote against him for president. And that ultimately, well, you know, I think the vote ultimately turned out, I think it was 60, 58, uh, Griffith was elected. Um, at that point, and it's actually one of the sadder moments, um, just before that election was held, when it was clear that the vote um, was going ahead, De Valera had been defeated, and they were going ahead then on the on the tent with the vote for um, on, on the proposal of Michael Collins for Griffith. Just before the vote was held, Griffith um, De Valera stood up and led his deputies from the from the doll, and you know the the it, it's it's quite vicious. And Collins gets up and he he describes them first of all as deserters all and. There's, I think, David Dahi Kant and Cork shouts up the Republic, and then Constance Markovich describes them as as um, like Georgeites and, and 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 traitors and so on. And then at one stage, Collins comes back and he shouts, he calls them foreigners, English and Americans, and 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 so on. And it's, it's quite sad actually to, to see that happen. And this famous photograph that that that's here, um, they are the anti-treaty deputies that had had just they had just left the doll at that point, um. So if you like, that marks the, the culmination, it marks the end of, if you like, the process that began, if you want, you know, you can stretch it right back to July 1921, the treaty negotiations right the way through. And we're now, you know, here we are in, 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 in January 10th, 1922, and we're facing into, even at that time, we're looking at it now with the benefit of hindsight and, and, and we're looking at it through our lens. Um, but even at that time, and it's clear in the speeches, that these people knew, they knew what was what was coming. Um, you know, there's there's people uh, in in the latter speeches, and they talk about their fear of fascist strife and, and so on. So it's it, it's quite sad and it's quite ominous um, to know that you know the people on both sides that would that would not survive this 
Um, you know, we're, we're, we're look, looking at the number of the faces that are here. You know, a number of them would die. Um, um, you know, would be executed. Um, or would suffer long terms of imprisonment and 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 so on. Um, but as I say, you can see on that day the demarcation lines that were drawn that would ultimately mark Irish political life. You know, for the the next hundred years, really, and. Uh, um, if you like, the scars of those divisions are still with us. But as I say, a really, really fascinating period and um, a really fascinating cast of characters. And I would really advise anyone that hasn't to go back and to dip into those speeches and to, and, and, and to see the human investment there on both sides and both sides. And that real sense of patriotism and the sense that, you know, we're doing this for Ireland. And I just finish on this note. And it's I I I I it was a comment I think it 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 it, it was made I think it was by by the late Kevin Boland when he talked about the 1960s period when that revolutionary generation were were dying out if you like and there was you know that that the, the handover of the generations was happening at that stage but it was the time when if you like that new generation of politicians were coming in and there was the talk of the Taka within Fianna Fáil and the Moher Super Brigade and this. You know the beginnings of the kind of um, corruption and so on that would seep into Irish body politic in, in in the 70s and the 80s was beginning to seep in then, and I think it was Bolan made the observation that that was one thing that marked out that revolutionary generation, and he and he and he made it clear it was on both sides, you know, be the Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, whatever, that there was that sense of national duty about those people. These were people who had come through a revolution, they had entered politics out of a sense of um, uh, idealism and a sense of duty, and 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 that that was kind of that was their their anchor and their compass right through. So as I say, the the treaty debates they uh, they they make for a sad reading in many respects because you see this great national movement breaking up literally before your eyes. And um, they also um, make for as I say, a, you know, a fascinating insight into the thinking of of that generation, that revolutionary generation. Because I think if 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 anything encapsulated it's those those twelve sessions of the doll, it's kind of the coming together of all of those forces of that period of 1916-23. And it's you 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 if if you like history opens up a window and you have an opportunity to kind of really look inside the minds of these people and what makes them tick. And uh, as I say, it's 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 really been fascinating. So at this point, um, I'd like to hand back to Marcus and thank you again oh. for uh, for for having me here tonight. Des, that was absolutely brilliant. Uh, it was enthralled in actually finding out um, the intricacies of the treaty debate. We have some excellent questions here tonight, so we'll definitely have you on your toes. Um, just uh, one question, I suppose, for me is, uh, was there any dates in, that you think that were key to convincing people? Um, like, had everyone made up their minds by the return in, in January or was it already made up in December, do you think? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I'd say it, 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 it depends. It, you know, it, you know, it does. And I'd say there was quite a number of swing. I think that's why there was such an emphasis made on, mm. and I think De Valera recognised it, um, on, 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 on trying to have the vote before Christmas. Um, they, they received knowledge um, and, and a verdict would be that if the vote had been taken on the 22nd of December, the treaty would have been defeated. I'm not so sure. I, I think it's a strong possibility, um, but it's like any of the things you can never be sure. Yeah. But I do think that the Christmas break certainly had a, a big influence. I think like the fact, as I said, the two examples I gave there, Dan O'Rourke and Frank Drawn are, 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 are prime examples of that. Um, there was huge influence brought to bear. And the IRB, for instance, they, they cranked up the gear as well. Like Tom McGuire in Mayo, uh, who was one of the most resolute of the, of the anti-treatyites, and Tom went on to be one of the stalwarts of the second doll afterwards. He talks about like being. He was a member of the IRB himself, and he, he there was an approach made to him. Um, I think early in January, uh, when he had just returned from the Christmas break by the IRB, and he was said to him, you know, you 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 have to vote the right way on this, and you have to you have to support the treaty. Now he told him in uncertain terms where he stood, but that kind of thing was happening was going on as well. Like there was talks of, um, I think one of the TDs in Limerick, I think he, like he he was called. By the bishop and told, you know, this is the views of the church and this is the view of the of your of your of your of your constituents, um, to support the um, 
to you know to support the treaty and so on and the, that had a profound effect on on a, on, a, on a lot of those TDs that were that were wavering if you like you know so I, I I I would I would say that that Christmas break um Marcus was probably the key period that kind of really probably swung that balance and we're, as I say we're talking about four four TDs kind of made the difference really in that yeah and for people who don't know how different is De Valera's document number two to the treaty or is it similar um, or <clears throat> Again, this is this is a, a, a big point of, of debate and, 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 and contention, mm. uh, you know, and it's it said a number of times during the, the, the by the by the pro treaty side during the debates um, they make references to it, you know, uh, when particularly in the private sessions when they have the document in front of them and um, they're arguing like that there's there's no difference between this and um and, and the treaty and you're expecting this to go to war on on this and of the, actually the anti-treaty side will you say in return or de Valera says in return in reply and and, and, and brewer well you, know, you can't have it both ways it's just so, are, are, you know are the are the english it's going to um, are, are, are the english going to go to war on the difference between oh. the two documents there, there, there are no there, there there's some some important differences like for instance de Valera in the in document number two um, for the um, for the calling of the of the of the southern um, the, the southern parliament, he makes it clear that it's for all constituencies. So that would be an all Ireland body that would meet, mm -hmm. you know, on that. Um, other things like, for instance, they he, they talk about the um, the uh, um, a kind of a, a giant citizenship, or it's not a giant. I'm trying to the exact words used in, in document number two, but it's 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 kind of a dual citizenship idea. Um, again, this was this kind of external association idea that it would be an independent Ireland, but that would have a relationship with the the British Commonwealth of Nations, um, um, and that there would be a dual citizenship. Now that's actually something that does actually carry through. Even I I, I heard that point be made by um. I think it was uh, Michal Farhagi actually the other day was making that point that if you look at the uh, um, the actual current status of Irish citizens today, um, Irish citizens actually can travel, have you know freedom of movement back and forth between Britain and Ireland, and um, you know they're not they're not um, bound by the same kind of travel restrictions and so on that, that our Europeans are. So even that that's an element of the kind of uh, element that was in document or two. Basically, what De Valera was saying in, 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 in document number two was that he was going as close to the treaty as was possible while trying to reconcile it with a kind of Republican aspiration. His idea was, and I think the language he used was that he was a bridge between, if you like, Stack and Brewer on one side and Griffith and Collins on, on the other, and that this was the best formula that could try and bring the two together. Now, we didn't always do that because, mm. for instance, People like Kathleen Clark was vehemently opposed to document number two and made that clear in no uncertain terms. Ernie O'Malley had pledged De Valera support um, just prior to the beginning of the treaty debates. He pledged him the support of the first and second Southern divisions uh, to, you know, to take whatever action was required to defend the Republic. When he heard about document number two, he actually made he, he actually traveled to Dublin and met with Mellows and said to Mellows, if this is to be the position of the president, I'm withdrawing my, my pledge of support. Sure. Um, like people like Todd Andrews is skating about document number two. He, he says it, it, it became a, a, a weapon in the hands of the pro treaty side because they were able to argue, well, you're not really that doctrinaire, are you? You know, you're not mm. really that pure Republicans. So, you know, you've, you've already kind of conceded all of this ground. But, um, it, you know, I, I, I think it's, it, it's an interesting document um, in, in itself at the same time. And it does, it does bear some study. Um, and one of the interesting things about it is um, it was only uh, distributed in the private sessions. Um, and those private sessions actually were not, they, they, it wasn't until 1969 when this, this volume was published. Um, that was the first time that the Irish people actually got a chance to read document number two. It was actually kept it was for almost 50 years. It was actually, uh, it, 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 it actually wasn't distributed. Um, Griffith leaked the copy of it um, on the, uh, I think it was just after the, the Christmas break and De Valera was seeding about that and he actually gives that as one of his grounds for tendering his resignation because mm -hmm. he said the trust within their cabinet had now been lost and Griffith's argument was that 
we're arguing with one hand tied behind our back. The people are entitled to know, you know, this is this is what your true position. So it was it was quite a controversial document, um, yeah. as I say, on both sides, and it certainly didn't win all support on the on the on the anti treaty side, you know. Okay, John Dorney has asked, uh, does Des agree that Collins in particular and some others on the pro treaty side, like O'Duffy, were deeply against partition? Oh, I, I, I do. I know I, I do agree with that. And, and I think that's 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 um, played out by, I mean, Collins, you can see that in his actions um, in the period between January and June 1922. Yeah. And in some respects, some of his actions actually almost precipitated the attack on the four courts because, for instance, the shooting of, of Henry Wilson in London um, actually gave the British the pretext then to come put pressure on the on the free state to, to launch the attack on, on on the four courts. And you know, you have the famous example of the, the transfer of weapons and so on and uh, you know across the border. And it's why so many of the northern divisions and members of the volunteers of the northern divisions actually ironically were very pro-treaty because yeah. again they were they were accepting the bona fides of Collins and so on on that. Um, and likewise, I mean, you know, uh, O'Duffy and that speaks in the Dahl debates. Um, you know, speaks very vehemently against, you know, against against partition and and, and the effects of it. Okay. Um, we, you know, as I say, we can we can argue about the, the, how that plays out afterwards. But yeah, I, I would accept the bona fides at that stage. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Kevin O'Colla has asked, as the treaty was signed under the threat of immediate and terrible war, meaning that the treaty was illegal under even British contract law. And the endorsement by voting for the treaty would have been ultra vires due to the oath that every TD had taken to defend the Republic. So his question is, why wasn't a court case taken about the treaty to check its validity? Would you have an opinion on that or tricky one? Oh, I, I don't. I, it's a tricky, know, I, it's I a tricky know question. That, you know, I, I know, I know that regarding a court case, I know that in the debates themselves, I mean, that point's made. Yeah. A word stampede is one word that's used regularly by a number of pro anti treaty speakers that the people are being stampeded into this. Um, um, you know, Dorothy McArdle, for instance, even in, in, in not in the treaty debates, but in reference to the press, she says that one of the, the actions of the press is to stampede people to, to make them terror stricken and, and fear the consequences of not supporting the treaty. And, you know, like Mellows talks about it being the fear of the people, not the will of the people that's being played on here. And so on, and even on the pro-treaty side, a number of them are at pains to say, you know, we signed because of this immediate threat, just threat of immediate and terrible war, and so on. So that that's that's very much in the atmosphere, mm. and you know, a number of and, and a number of deputies make that point that you know, um, as members of the Dáil, you know, it's not in our gift to to take an action that would subvert the Republic. And that, 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 that's actually also an argument that's made. De Valera himself actually makes that point as well. And that's why he says that we actually can't ratify this treaty. We can we can express an approval or disapproval of it. Um, so like, you know, all those points actually were addressed during the treaty debates. But as I say, that, that point about the, 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 the stampeding of people is quite interesting. And for instance, just a, a last point on that, you know, um, how much that was part of that Republican narrative of that time, that even Pat O'Donnell's book, his famous book, um, The Gates Flew Open, which is his prison memoir of the Civil War, he dedicates that book to the, to the generation that milled the stampede in 1922. So again, it's, it's very much part of the, of the, of the, the, Republican, um, the Republican narrative of that, that people were being driven over this cliff edge. Okay. Uh, I just want to say something, just in case I forget to say it, because it's very important. Dermot Aylworth is on tonight. His father, Ned Aylworth, took part in the treaty debates. Yes. And we also have people mm. uh, who are relatives on the pro-treaty side, including Michael Collins' relations, who are on tonight as well. So I just want to say welcome. welcome to everybody here. Um, Traz and Atira, uh, have said from Connor Freeman, he's asking the question, considering his hesitancy and the fact that he was the last of the delegation to sign the Articles of Agreement, how enthusiastic was George Gavin Duffy on the benefits of the treaty during the dull debates? Not very enthusiastic. In, in fairness, um, there, 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 there's kind of nobody jumping for joy about the, the, the benefits of the treaty to a degree. Griffith is probably the most enthusiastic, you know, and, and that's quite a, a, in his speeches. He's really selling the treaty. This is his, you know, this is his thing. And um, that's a point that's actually made by 
by Brua um, and Mary, Mary McSweeney in particular in, in one of her, uh, in her speech, because she, she actually says to Brua, you know, th this is the sum of what you'd always wanted. You know, you, she was basically saying to him, you were never a Republican. You know, you're not of our tradition. But um, regarding Gavin Duffy, no. And I, I mean, that that's clear even from the, he, he makes no bones about it. He, he basically says that what, what swung him was that he, he didn't feel that he would be justified in 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 um, making a decision over peace or war, and that he you know he felt that the alternative, however badly he felt about it, was that if he didn't support the um, if he didn't support the treaty, there would be war, and and that was basically his some reason for for, for supporting it, and and he, and he actually he said that in 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 the in the debates, um because really even during the the negotiations. The, the delegation were divided, I think, as, as we talked about the last time. So you basically had Barton, Gavin Duffy, and Childers as secretary. They were, if you like, the Republican wing of that delegation. And that remained very much the case, um, you know. But as I say, he at that stage, he had thrown in his lot. And as he said, he'd signed the treaty and he was honour bound then to support it. Was there, after the vote was taken, uh, was there a deliberate attempt by the anti treaty to? Like subvert the rule of the doll after by De Valera resigning and then looking to be reelected. Some of the full treaty, I think, mentioned that it was a tactic. Well, like what was going on? Was there anything to that, or was it? Um, yeah, I, I know. Like there was, I, 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 there was accusation. Like like W. G. Cosgrave, for instance, said, you know, this is a regular, you know, that the minority don't move the motion, you know, to elect the president or elect the government. That that's up to the majority and so on. Um, there seemed to be a hesitancy, <clears throat> excuse me, on the other side as well. Like there was mm. a hesitancy. At Collins, Collins initially, he proposed a committee, which would be combined to two, and like that was ruled out immediately by De Valera and Maxweeney and others and, and McEntee. <clears throat> so at that point, De Valera, yeah, I think he tried to take the initiative. I think De Valera again was playing on the fact um, that his his own personal popularity was such that even those that had supported the treaty would vote for him. I think that, that was a, that was a miscalculation. I think and that's that's the argument that Captain Clark had made to him. Um, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I think he would have been in an impossible position if 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 he had won that election because he effectively like he was going to be in a minority as 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 president. Yeah. Um, and and I don't know where that where that where that was going to go, but um, yeah, I mean it was, you know, and it was only at that point then that Collins then realized, you know, as he said in the speech. There has to be a captain of the ship. So mm -hmm. at that point, then they, they proposed Griffith. Then you know when 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 De Valera went forward and was defeated, then Griffith then was 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 proposed in his place. But I think there was a hesitancy on the pro treaty side, and I think when De Valera saw that there was a gap, if you like, and and they 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 they, they went through that, you know, or tried to go through that. Okay. And as I say, the vote was quite narrow. It was like two two votes in the in 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 the in the in the difference. Yeah, and and Liam Shorthall has asked. Did the British do anything to try and influence the treaty vote? Like, was there any intimidation or, you know, the immediate and terrible war that may have followed rejection? Well, I think they had they had they had done that. And actually, that's something I didn't talk about. But um, I mean, the, 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 the debates in in Westminster are interesting. And in contrast to the doll, they had all wrapped up in two in three days. Um, but actually, some of the some of the the comments that were made there, like they're really selling the treaty from a British perspective. Like Col Churchill talks about like the oath, for instance, and he says the oath is of a much more profound and searching nature than anything that would be administered to any of the other colonies and so on. And um, um, one of the most interesting one of the most interesting um, interjections there was by Austin Chamberlain, and it again it relates to the immediate and terrible war threat. And he actually admits um, that there had been an under undertaking given to Craig that he would be given sight of the treaty before it was signed. Now, this contradicts Griffith's, you know, uh, assertion on the night of December 5th that I, ha you know, I have in my hand two pieces of paper, you know, and one means war and the other is a signed treaty. And both are, you know, there's a train under steam ready to go to Belfast, blah, blah, blah. And it gives a light to that because what, what, what Chamberlain is saying is that actually it was the contrary. That they actually had, they had told Craig that nothing would be signed until he had seen it, and that was precisely what the treaty delegation were asking for. They were asking for that same time that they could travel to Dublin, 
So it actually contradicts that. During the debates themselves, though, I think at, at that point, I think that message was being conveyed by the pro-treaty side, really. You know, they were saying it in the, in the doll that the alternative to this is war, you know, and um, are, we, are you know, is this something that we're prepared to, we're prepared to do? And then the, the, the press really took that up with gusto, you know, and they really, really pushed that home so that they, that atmosphere was really created for that Christmas period. Um, there was a, a momentum, if you like, a built up outside that, you know, we, you know, we either support this or, or, or you know, the, the consequences are war and we're, we're back to what I was talking about there a minute ago. We're back to the idea of people being stampeded towards this, towards this, um, towards this end. What, what's interesting, I, I'm reading um, the facts and figures of the Belfast programs, you know, and between January the 1st and January the 5th, there's like five bomb outrages on the Catholic community. There's rioting in York Street. There's a curfew of 8 p.m. There's an infant who's shot dead. There's a child wounded in Commute Street. There's eight deaths. Yeah. And yet it seems that the Freeman's Journal was being discussed on the 5th of January. And you, you can't help but wonder, like, why is neither side talking about this? Did it not know? Or Yeah, actually, the only the only person I actually mentioned, McEntee, again, he's from Belfast. McEntee mentions those mm. deaths. He mentions the deaths, actually, um, in, 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 in his intervention. Um, um He's he's the only one to do that, and again, it's it's like I you know it, uh, looking at the debate and reading them, it's like at that stage they were almost in a bubble, mm -hmm. and they were literally oblivious to everything else that was going on around. And again, I suppose we have to be aware the time uh, you know in terms of the 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 um, you know how quickly information would travel and so on. But I think they were literally in that 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 bubble in that period. But as I say. It is significant that that McEntee, again, you know, um, he's 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 from Belfast. He does mention it, but it is, yeah, definitely, it is. It, it, there's there's very little mention actually of what's happening on the ground, uh, and had been for the months previous. And that that summer of 1921 and July of 1921 was a was a very bloody summer in 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 the north. And again, it merits barely a mention um, throughout the debates. Uh, Neil Collins Powell has asked. Following the walkout, was Liam Lynch de facto leader of the anti-treaty, or was it somebody else? Um, well, at that stage, um, that's when the calls then began for a, an army executive. At that stage, you know, at least passively, the, the same structures remained in place. Um, you know, Mulcahy remained recognised as chief of staff and so on. But there was definitely moves. People like the key people probably... Ironically, Lynch and that were less um, militantly, uh, he was seen as kind of one of the more moderates actually at that point um, and trying to preserve a unity within the army. Those that were kind of driving, the real driving forces for a convention would have been people like Rory O'Connor, uh, Ernie O'Malley, um, Seamus Robinson, people like that. They were, and when, when Lynch was elected as chief of staff at that convention, he was elected because he was kind of seen as somebody that kind of could bring together Kind of all sections within the within the anti-treaty side, and um, so um, the, yeah, the structures of the army kind of remain. Now, the, the coming them on executive mesh, they met actually on the following day, on the eleventh of January, and they voted, I think, something like twenty nine two against the treaty, and then they held their convention on the fifth of February, and again, overwhelmingly rejected the treaty. Um, but the army then was was much more difficult because there was there was. Um, there was, you know, there was uh, resistance to them holding a convention as well, um, and it, it it led to a standoff, you know, and then yeah, 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 the whole situation and in, in Limerick, um, yeah, the Limerick crisis and so on, they all came into that. So all that was all coming into play. That's why going back to what <clears throat> James Robinson was saying there, Robinson's intervention is very very interesting because I say Robinson, if you like, was the vice of O'Malley and those within the doll, and what he was saying was probably. That was a waving of the flag that you know this is coming down the line and there is going to be division. But at that particular moment in time, the basic structures were still in place. Like it, you know, at that stage in January, um, Mulcahy was still maintaining it's the army of the Republic and so on, and nothing has changed. But at that stage, it was probably whistling past the graveyard. You know, the, 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 that ship had sailed and, and things were, were were taking on a life of their own. Given has got a really interesting question. Um, if the vote on the treaty had gone the other way, like the treaty, the treaty was defeated, 
what would happen then like with pro treaty forces that have had to bow to the vote and with that defeat the treaty what was going to happen if that had happened it's an interesting question and um, i mean people like collins and so on they were adamant that you know collins had said throughout like that if 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 the people rejected it and if the people said we we, we go back to war then we you know we you know I, we go back on the same footing and so on you know how how it would have played i i don't know um um i i i think at that stage i i, I think for people like griffith he had invested so much and stake so much in the treaty i think it, it would have been very difficult for him to go back into the position that he'd been in um i think it would have changed the whole dynamic myself this is just my own reading of it now um i definitely think it would have changed the dynamic and I, I I don't think it would have been simply a case of kind of reset and everything is back as it was, mm. because I think there would have been all kinds of questions being asked about well you were prepared to accept this and you you know you you've gone so far and and so on and where do we go from here? But um, definitely you know I I I think it would have been it would have been difficult to put an administration together uh, outside of that. Now having said that, there were there was on the pro treaty side there were those that were maybe really, that were wavering and that, that that for them that would have been the that would have been the uh, the catalyst to <clears throat> to revert back to the anti treaty side and so on, but uh, yeah, it definitely would have created a very interesting situation. I think ultimately, as I say, I think people like Collins and that probably ultimately, I think they would have they would have you know taken taken the, taken their position there. But I think as I say, relations and dynamics and so on would have changed. You know, I think that the, the definitely would have been uh, it it would have been it would have been a different movement that would have emerged from it all. You know. Okay. Did uh, Neil's asking? Um, did the treaty election offer um, like a new mandate for the Free State to tear, or like could the treaty have been teared up like at any stage after um, the treaty had, you know, the election of the treaty had taken place? The, 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 the pact election in, in yeah yeah June. yeah yeah um, yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah, well, you see, you see, that's the thing. Like, I mean, technically, the treaty was never voted on by the like. That's one of the things in 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 the doll debates is it's constantly referred that this has to go to the people and so on. And it said during the negotiations as well. And technically, it, it actually was never put to the people. Now, mm -hmm. you know, um, you can you can you can argue obviously and it legitimately can be argued like that those that cast a vote for the pro treaty candidate, um, that that was that was de facto a, a, vote, a vote for the treaty. But that was a, a PR election. And one of the, inter again, if you look at that, the intricacies of that election is quite interesting is that, for instance, on the ballot paper, there was no party affiliation given on the ballot paper. Now, most people in their area would know their TDs, if, you know, so they would know, um, for instance, in, in a constituency where um, we say you, you had Michael Collins, which also had Sean Mylan and so on on the, on the ballot. They would know Milan was anti-treaty. Obviously, we know Collins was pro-treaty. You know, they would know their TDs and know their position on it. But one of the other interesting things is about the, the level, the amount of transfers that went on. There was a high level of transfers between the pro and anti-treaty Sinn Fein candidates. Um, so it's that that vote is not quite as clear cut as as sometimes as as betrayed. Um, there was a there was there was again quite a bit of nuance to how people were voting. And I think, like for instance, and that's reflected in the August 1923 election, where on the face of it, Sinn Féin should have been wiped out. The like, anti-treaty should have been wiped out in August by August 2023. I mean, there was something like 12,000 um, people in, in, in turned. You know, it's it's the movement had been crushed. And yet it returned, you know, um, it got close to, um, you know, close to 40% of the vote. So it's, you know, there was obviously qu still quite a level of support there on the ground. Um, that and, and for instance, in the West, um and northwest there was a very very strong still remain even in june 1922 quite a strong um uh, republican vote so uh, yeah you know obviously the the, the pro-treaty side can say that the treaty was ratified in the election but i i would i would argue like that there's a little bit more nuance to that that june mm. 19, 1922 election and mm. uh, i think a lot of other things that were, that were that were going on there i think that's uh the constitution like as well, as well. And, yeah, yeah 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 um what was it could you explain what the house of commons of southern ireland was i was looking at what the treaty actually was and there was a sitting of the house of commons yeah. of southern ireland 
Yeah. Well, effectively, that was the parliament um, that was <coughs> provided for in the Government of Ireland Act. Uh, the Westminster Government of Ireland Act was passed in, in, in December of 1920. Um, and that provided for Stormont for the, the Northern Parliament and the Parliament of Southern Ireland. And you see, this is why the, 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 the British never recognised the doll. So that um, even, that's why even in the, in, the, in the wording of the treaty, the doll is not mentioned in the treaty. It's the, this Parliament of Southern Ireland. So when that meets, or this assembly meets on the 14th of January. And some Republicans would argue that Leinster House actually dates from, its centenary isn't from January 1919, it's actually from January 1922. But basically this assembly meets. Now in the debates, Mary McSweeney, for instance, asks, explicitly asks Griffith on, on three occasions, and as does Childers as well, what is the constitutional status of this assembly? Is it is it a parliament? You know, are you going to rename it the doll because it's not the doll? Um, and the exclusion of Sean O'Mahony shows that it's not the doll, that it's not a, a 32 county body. But that's that's basically when that body meets, and um, they 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 formally that's the formal ratification process of the treaty. And the pro treaty TDs go in to, um, I think it's held in the RDS. I think um, John John would be able to tell you. I, I, I'd need to look that up. Mm. Um, but they meet on the. Um, they meet on the 14th of January. Coming them on actually placed the picket on that meeting as, as it occurred. And uh, they actually handed out leaflets saying that, you know, this is an abandonment of the, of the Republic and so on. But th th that was the formal vote there. And um, Republicans then would argue that when the third doll, as it was described, met in September of or August 1922, that it actually wasn't, that wasn't the All Ireland doll. That was actually the parliament that was provided for in the government of Ireland Act. So that's, that's, you know, it's a very constitutionally, it's a very hazy period. Yeah. And John Regan has done a lot of work on this. He, like, he, he makes the argument that in many respects, the provisional government, the pro-treaty provisional government constitutionally really did not have a mandate. Mm. Uh, their, their, their mandate was very, very suspect from mm. January right through to really to the civil war. Um, you know, their, 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 their constitutional position was, you know, there was definitely a major question mark over it, you know, okay. and that if he, he argues, for instance, like that effectively what was being run was the military council um, of the IRB was effectively running the government at that stage. Okay. I just read out some of the comments. Uh, John Dorney, thanks, Des, enjoyable talk. Neil Collins Powell, thank you, Des, great insights making for a revealing talk. Wayne O'Brien, thank you, very interesting. Steve and Coyle, thanks, Des, for another enthralling presentation. Colin O'Rourke, excellent talk from Des. If anyone would like to see some of Des's past talks, you should check out his talks on the flying columns. That was a brilliant one, that Des. Margaret Buckley, uh, as well, the first female political leader in Ireland and his recent treaty negotiations lectures, all on Trouds and Natira. Tom Feeney, thanks so much, Des. Really enjoyable talk. Thanks for all your hard work. Thanks for a great presentation, as always, Des, says Colm O'Rourke. Um, PJ, I said thanks to Des Dalton, not only for tonight's presentation, but for all his ongoing research and online contributions and detail on the treaty. Have to back him up there. As he said, an incredibly sad outcome with truly wonderful men and women who had the courage to take on and defeat the then British Empire, regrettably ending up on opposing sides. We owe them all a debt of gratitude. Mel, fascinating and really well navigated across such a battlefield of eggshells. Well done, Des and Marcus. Go to my gut. Uh, Sharon, just a quick question. Why was the church so much in favour of, of the treaty and who was pushing the priests to tell their parishioners to vote pro-treaty? Joe, just... Um, Sorry? About the, church, about the church. Why was the church so much in favour of the treaty? Or who was pushing well, the priests to do that? They, the, again, the, the 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 church ultimately, and you even look, like, if you look at the you know, the, the church, ultimately will, will will go with the with the status quo. I mean, that had been it's 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 history. Like it was only really when, um, it was quite obvious that the national forces were in the ascendant to a certain extent during the War of Independence that the church, and even then, as an established church, a lot of the 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 the, 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 the grassroots clergy. Uh, were much more vociferous in their support, but as an institution, the church remained very much on the fence for much of the War of Independence. So it was no surprise, really, that when they saw an opportunity for some kind of stabilisation, they saw that this was the wind was blowing. This was going to be the new dispensation, 
um, they were going to row in. And I mean, if you look at the major forces that rode in behind the new state when it got itself set up, yes, you had that original revolutionary cohort of you know, columns and so on, but you very quickly got those that would have been traditionally the strong supporters of the old Irish party and so on, um, you know, the, the you know, the kind of the the the, the, the big farmer, um, the kind of you know the more the, you know the, the stake in the country people, as as, as Mellows put it, they very quickly rode in. So the church as an institution, um, very much threw its lot in on the pro treaty side because they saw that as the, the best route to stability of you know establishing order again, and um, <clears throat> I actually I, I wrote a piece on this when it when it was in Trinity actually on on the role that the church played in the civil war. I mean, the church in many respects gave a, a, a moral cover to the to the state mm -hmm. uh, for the worst successes that it carried out. I mean, you know, it's no coincidence that when the Public Order Act was introduced, which allowed for the executions and so on, in September 19, October, I think it was 1922, the bishop's pastor was issued at the same time. Yeah. It basically, you know, um, excommunicated anybody that, that continued to take up arms against the state. And the, and the church, you know, continued to kind of give that that cover. So, yeah, I mean, it was it 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 it's no it you know it, it's no surprise that as an institution, it did. And yet, funnily enough, the Vatican were slower to give recognition to the to the new state. And there's a fa there's fascinating correspondence actually in uh, particularly in the 1923 period. And oh, yeah. there's quite an amount of correspondence going on between De Valera and the Second All People and the Vatican. And the state, and the state are actually quite angry. Uh, the Free State are quite angry that the Vatican are, are maintaining a correspondence with the you know the people that they regard as subversives now at this point. So it's it's it, it that that's an interesting dynamic as well, you know. Okay. A uh, last question is from Eamon Bohan. Uh, not including the Northern MPs, is there anyone who stands out of the fifty-eight MPs who voted against the treaty in the House of Commons? Like, was a very uh, unified vote. Is there anybody who stood out or not? Would you know? Top of your head. Uh, not really, no. I, I think like really much of it was uh, it, it it played out. You had that, you know, in a different context. Like George, you know, you you, you would hear the word diehard used, um, in a, in a civil war context here, referring to Republicans. But like George talked about the diehards in, in the House of Commons, and there were a more kind of hardline unionist element, particularly within the within the Tory Party, um. But they were, they were, you know, they were very much in the minority. But yeah, I think, I think it kind of just it, it more or less played out along expected lines. I don't think there was that I'm aware of. I don't think there was there was any significant vote okay. against it. Um, no, I think it, I think it was kind of just as 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 expected. Well, to wrap up, I just wanted to say I think you're an absolute legend in terms of striking, you know, an impartial, objective balance in terms of what happened because it's such an emotive subject. And I think your posts on Facebook have been incredible about it. You're looking at doing a website. You're looking at possibly publishing a book about it too. And please check out Des Dalton on Facebook, but also look him up on Trazden Natira with some of his talks, as Colin said, on Margaret Buckley and on the flying columns as well, and the treaty um, negotiations as well. Des, pleasure and honour as always. It was a fascinating talk. Learned a lot. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marcus. And thanks again. And thanks to Trust Here for all you do. I think you're, you're a fantastic platform uh, for the access that you give to so many people out there and so many scholars and, 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 and so many really good historians that are out there. You give a fantastic platform and so much enjoyment to, to, to the rest of us as well. So yeah. well done and, 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 and uh, must save on that to, to, to everybody concerned. Yeah, thanks to Liam O'Sullivan as well, who's a legend. Uh, okay, thanks a million. I'll see you again, Des. Take care of yourself. Thanks, everybody. All the best. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye